you all for indulging me. I appreciate you sharing pieces of yourself. Uh, it just helps me know who I'm speaking with uh, better. I'm here to talk a little bit about my journey into the ELCA. As stated, I am Annie Jones Barnes. I am the daughter of DeWitt and Gloria Jones. Uh, Gloria is deceased. She died about three years ago. God rest her soul. I am the second of seven children and I have one brother who passed away six months um, after my mother. It was a very, very uh, trying time. But out of uh, the six of us that are, are here, I'm gonna say four of us are pastors. Uh, my dad um, pastored for a really long time. Uh, we grew up in Chicago and I actually came here when I was 10 years old, my, um, my, my parents were trying to figure out a way to get us out of the Chicago area. One of our Sunday school friends, he was 12 years old and he was shot in the face and killed. And so my parents started dreaming of a way to get us out of that environment and my mother had two sisters here in Tacoma, Washington uh, at the time and um, we came out here and the rest is history. But I felt like Tacoma uh, was a place that welcomed all of who I was and who I am becoming. And out of all of my siblings, I'm the only one here in Tacoma. And I've decided to dedicate my life to Tacoma. Um, it's interesting, and I, I, I was telling uh, George that I had two other ordinations, um, the first one in 91. And uh, I have been on pastoral teams for a really, really long time. I felt um, the call to pastor. I've always been a lover of people because uh, my parents were lovers and, and my dad is still a lover of people. And that's what was modeled um, to us. And my parents modeled a relationship with God, Jesus. That was important. And they taught us about prayer and tapping in to the spirit within. So my journey has been long. Just yesterday, I was on, online for a birthday party earlier in the day. My aunt uh, turned 90 yesterday, and she had a long soliloquy as she spoke, right? And you know, 90 years is a long time. Uh, but I'm, I'm 62, and I got a little story in me, too. So I've got to make this as uh, succinct as possible because I could talk and talk and talk. I too am a musician. I'm a professional uh, bassist. I just did a recording uh, a couple of weeks ago and I'm gonna fly to Dallas at the end of the month to do some overdubs. Uh, I gotta fix some mistakes. I get a do over. Um, but I, I love life and I love, love, love God. I believe in the 
power of God. And I believe in the power of prayer. And I believe that God indeed does live in us and speak to us. I was working um, for a nonprofit. I worked for a nonprofit for about 20 years. And uh, it's called, it was called Northwest Leadership Foundation. We sent uh, kids to school on full right, full need scholarships. Probably 700, 800 scholars right now that have come back uh, to the Tacoma area. We talked about loving the city and being committed to the city. Um, uh, the nonprofit uh, served gang kids, kids that were in gangs and worked to interrupt the patterns of violence uh, and help them write a new narrative. Um, we had mentoring programs uh, and the likes. And my job, I, I had several um, through the history of that organization, um, but I ended up, I uh, was the executive pastor. So everything as it relates to HR came under uh, my purview. And then I uh, became the executive vice president of the agency where I raised money. And that was the work, raising uh, the budget. And the budget would fluctuate from anywhere from 2 million to, to 5 million. But 60% of that went out the door um, to other ministries and to, to the programs. Here's what's interesting. In that time, I met a pastor from the Lutheran church. His name is Ron Vignette. He's mm -hmm. gone on uh, now, but he was at the uh, pastor's table that we hosted and we had Presbyterians uh, Lutherans, Church of God in Christ, Baptists, Methodists, uh, and there were plenty of things that divided us, but we decided to come together on what we could agree on. And what we could agree on is that uh, young people needed to know that there is a church that loves and care uh, for them. And so we raised money to hire full-time youth workers to be with kids, not to get them to the church, but to love them and be loving uh, adult mentors in their lives. Pastor Ron was at that table and I watched him. It was interesting because our paths had crossed earlier. A church um, that I was a youth pastor at had moved to the east side and Pastor Ron showed up to welcome us there. Flash forward, I meet this guy at this table of pastors and I'm just listening to him talking and we're uh, diatribing and having conversations and after he retired from uh, the Lutheran Salishan mission he came over to work for our nonprofit. And so I would watch him do ministry. And we called him the Bishop of the East Side because he so loved the community. It mattered less who you were or where you came from. Pastor Ron was about loving people. And I saw him, he would keep uh, dollar bills and loose cigarettes in his pockets. And the people would run to him and, and say, Pastor Ron, oh, I'm struggling. Oh, I just, and he'd give him a cigarette, light it and speak a word of grace to them, speak a word of faith. And it was like he was relevant in the moment. 
He had Safeway grocery cards in his pocket where he was, uh, Pastor Ron, I don't have any food. I'm just, I'm struggling. He'd take that card out and give it to him and say, go buy your groceries. And I'm like, man, I like that. I like walking out faith like that. And so we started talking and he says, Annie, he told me many times, he said, you really should be Lutheran. He <laughs> said, your, your theology, it aligns uh, with the Lutheran ministry. You, you need to think about it. And so I just, I thought about it and I, I thought, you know, of course you Lutherans, you want people to be educated in your way. <laughs> no way is okay except the Lutheran way. Oh, come on, laugh a little bit. It's all good. <laughs> and so the first time uh, he said that to me, I started thinking and uh, I talked to some people and they told me, I was going to have to go to uh, the Lutheran seminary. And I'm like, shoot, I don't want to do that. I've been ordained. All these years I've been working in community. I don't want to do that. Forget that. And then Pastor Moran got sick and he passed away. And I felt in my heart, uh, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me you know the holy spirit will speak to you and i felt the holy spirit speak to me in the moment and say Annie, you need to you need to go ahead and do that go ahead and be about that work and i'm like god i won't go over there and people say it's all white <laughs> ain't none of my cousins over there <laughs> right and so I just could not get away. I just, I, I just had something turning in me like this is what you're supposed to do. And here's the deal. I had been contemplating starting a church probably about 10 years. And I could have went back to the church that I grew up in, they had tried to recruit me to pastor over in that denomination, one of the largest denominations in the African-American uh, community. And it was so wild. My uh, my friend, he was the son of the bishop and you know that the, the polity and all of that that happens in the church. And so he was a superintendent and he says, Annie, come, please come and start your church here, please, please. And, and we talked, we were childhood friends, loved, loved, loved him. And I said, dude, man, I've been ordained for years. I don't feel like fighting with these men, trying to get them to accept me um, as their peer. And he says, Annie, don't worry about it. He said, I'll fight for you. And so I was thinking, I mean, we had been friends since I was 10 years old and he was nine. And so I was thinking and I was thinking, how about when I was just about there where I felt like, man, I, I think I could do this. He had a massive heart attack and was in a coma for 11 years. And I thought, oh my God, I was really, really safe from that. Uh, but here's the deal. I felt like if I went to my people that know me, I could have a big giant flourishing church. But here uh, I felt called to this predominantly white ministry. I believe that God desires for our love for each other to truly, truly be present. And so after a lot of prayer and talking to a lot of different people, I decided to take the Lutheran 
plunge, went uh, to your seminary, uh, Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary. I did three years there and uh, would travel to Berkeley uh, three times a year for an, you know, intensive. Um, we would be in class from about eight to 9 p.m. And then we'd have to come back home and do this uh, work. And so after a lot of time, in between those times, all that time, suffered a lot, a lot of death. So it took me a little longer. I lost my, my aunt. I lost uh, my mother. I lost my mother-in-law. I lost my brother. I lost my sister-in-law. And it went on. So it took me uh, a little longer. I got it done. And um, I knew that I wanted to start a new uh, church, a new ministry. Uh, and it, it's called Rock City. And the reason it's called Rock City is my husband and I, I'm, watch, I'm keeping track of the time. You all are generally done at eight. Is that correct? Okay. We're open. All right. I'm, I'm not going to go much longer. My husband and I were um, traveling from Yakima. It's where my parents were living at the time. When we travel over there, and, and one particular time we were coming back home, and I saw the snow melt running through the rocks. And I looked at my husband, I said, Ricky, I said, you know, you know that water is drinkable because the rocks are purifying that water. And, and then in that moment, the scripture, uh, Luke 1940 came to me, if you don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. And so I started praying around that and I knew Holy Spirit was speaking to me around this whole idea of rocks and inclusivity and our commonality. And that is how Rock City uh, was birthed. Uh, talked with the um, director of evangelical mission. Um, and, and here is another thing that got me around this idea of Lutheranism. It was the message of grace, grace for all. First Peter 4 and 10 talks about the various kinds of grace that God gives and us being aware of the gifts of grace. And one theologian said, uh, they translated it as the colors of grace. And when I thought about how many colors there were, I'm getting happy over here, I'm telling you. When I thought about how many colors there were, that grace thing spoke to me because it said, it, it, in my heart, I felt it said, for every situation, there is a color of grace. Excuse me, y'all. That preacher voice just sneaks out on me, okay? There's a color of grace. And so this idea of grace. Second thing was loving neighbor as self. That's what y'all talk about. That's what you all talk about. Loving neighbor as self. And I thought, man, I could be about that life. If there are people truly loving neighbor as self. And this is a core part of their theology. I think I could bring my mind around this, but they're all white, Annie, and you are black. And, and I started thinking because there are so many nuances uh, that happen racially and we know race 
it's a construct, a social construct and all of that, but it's real. Uh, it's real. And so uh, it's interesting, God's irony calling me to this predominantly white church. But I feel and I know that we are to be together. We are to know each other. The scripture says that they will know you are of the Christ by the love that you show to one another. And I've always been a different kind of bird. And I ain't scared of nobody, okay? I've never been afraid. And so I took the plunge into the Lutheran church. I feel called to gather rocks, people that have been hurt by the church. We've hurt a lot of people. We've hurt a lot of people. I feel called to be a rock gatherer and have those rocks cry out, let them know that there is a God that is in love with each one of them. This is not a fairy tale of me. I'm about that God life, God in me. And my work is to help people discover who they are. Discover, discover, you got to uncover some things. And I know y'all didn't call me here to preach. So I'm gonna lay back and um, you all can ask me questions. I do have uh, two uh, biological children and four inherited children, four bonus children one deceased. So yeah, there's a lot, a lot of tragedy that has happened. So I, I love people. I love God's people. And I'm about being God in action. What does that look like? How am I God's hands and feet? How am I showing love? How am I bringing life and light to people. That's the call. That's why I'm here. And that's kind of my quick, quick down and dirty journey to the Lutheran church. So I think uh, we're supposed to open up for questions. Now, we, I, man, that was pretty good. It's only seven, 33. I could have gone a lot longer, uh, but I want to give you all a chance um, to ask me questions and, and do whatever we do on it. You talked about your ministry. I first heard you speak at an Associated Ministries um, homeless uh, conference. And that's wow. where I first heard you, and I know you have great associations with that ministry, um, how, how are you involved in that now? Yeah, I am pretty involved. Um, I am co-vocational, uh, that's what they call it now, co-vocational. And I run a business uh, with my business partner and it, it focuses on equity, diversity and inclusion and anti-racism in organizational culture. So a lot of the work that I do with Associated Ministries is through that lens. I feel like that that is God's work. I feel called to it. It's something you have to be called to. And uh, that is how I interact with the Associated Ministries. I just saw Mike Yoder on Friday and we're spending some time together. We were in a meeting with um, 60 other leaders in the governmental organizations trying to figure out how to serve this community better. Um, and so 
that's that's what I do. I believe in um, helping people show up their best selves. That's how I'm involved with uh, Mike's team right now. I think I remember in a service that you a month ago that we were with you. You talked about going and driving by or through homeless communities too, just to stay absolutely, stay absolutely. I I do that. I drive through the homeless communities because I want to be moved and touched. I want to be inspired to do something. It, you know, we can we can drive past, drive around, and not be bothered. We don't want to see certain things, but I want to see them. Uh, because I want to embrace the work of making them whole. That is my desire. That's why I drive through. Uh, my husband and I just today were thinking uh, about, you know, we'll we'll um, we'll cook dinner and we'll we'll feed folks. But we were just thinking about. Um, creating some kind of laundry service um, for these, these folks that are out there, everybody. Um, people have fallen on hard times. Mm -hmm. And I know it could have been me outdoors yeah. with no food, with no clothes, nowhere to go. That could have been me. And if we are really truly called to love the people of God, they are God's people as well. And we, as people of faith, got to show up in the dark places. That's why I do that. Amen. Can you tell us a little bit about Rock City Lutheran and um, your folks that you've gathered into that community? Yeah, I can. Uh, it's interesting because Rock City Lutheran is filled with rocks. And a lot of the folks that come, they have no church experience. Uh, a lot of them have been hurt and abused by the church. A lot of them just, you know, they're showing up just for a place to love or to feel love. And I want to tell them, you know, I try, I work hard at telling them that you are amazing, just the way you are. You are God's greatest accomplishment. I work hard for that because here, here, herein lies the issue and what helps me. In this work, I had a brother, my brother who passed on uh, was gay. And the church we grew up in, it was, that was an abomination. Yeah. That was just sin, that, that was the worst thing ever. And so when I started Rock City, I was thinking about him because I wanted him to know that God loved him just the way he was. In his last days, probably last five months, he uh, was diagnosed with glioblastoma. And that is a very, very aggressive brain cancer. And uh, I was, my husband and I were his uh, caregivers. I was the power of attorney on all of his things. He was not married, but he was very, very tormented. The psychosis would happen as the cancers move through his brain. Yeah. Um, his psychosis was bananas. He was hallucinating. And what he was hallucinating about was the church stoning him. It broke my heart. It broke my heart. 
not what was going on in his brain. All of those things that he kept tapped down. He wasn't able to do that anymore because cancers had gone through and that stuff was real to him. And so it's folks like that. I guess I marry same uh, sex couples are welcome. Trans people to be their full selves in Christ. But that right there that happened to my brother that we watched for months as he was journeying through his valley of death. It just broke my heart. And so my, the Rock City ministry is just full of rocks, full of rocks. And that is the committed call for people to truly know that there's a God that is well pleased with them. We know that before, Jesus did any miracles that were recorded anyway. Before he did anything, as he was being baptized, the dove descended and the heavens opened and said, this is my son and I'm well pleased. And so I'm telling people, the people of Rock City, that God is pleased with you already. Know this. I know y'all know I'm passionate about this. And it's not just because I'm a Black woman. I'm passionate because I'm a lover of the presence of God. And I believe I, when, when we were um, young, my mother taught us a song, Everybody Ought to Know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is, right? And so I believe that everybody ought to know about this God we serve. And that's, that's uh, those are the folks at Rock City from, from professors to uh, city officials to homeless people to People every uh, walk of life, uh, they're there. And I get to serve them. And it's a real privilege. Well, how about your music background? I know I, I got to hear you play a little bit about a month ago. And <laughs> where, where did that inspiration come to? Yeah. You know, it's crazy because um, we are all musicians, everybody in my family. We're musicians. And um, I started playing bass. I play wind instruments like clarinet and uh, saxophone. And I started playing bass. I was uh, in concert band through school play contrabass fiddle. And my brother uh, was one year and two weeks older than me. And my younger brother is about two and a half years younger than me. Just fabulous, fabulous singers. Amazing singers. I have some amazing psalmists and musicians uh, in my family. They are Grammy nominated. And so when we were kids, bass players like you can hardly find them I mean we were always looking for a bass player we were those kids like the Partridge Partridge family we were traveling up and down the road singing uh, the gospel songs that that we had written and it's it's interesting because we couldn't keep a bass player and my brother said Andy what are we gonna do we can't we, we don't have a bass player and I said, I could do it. I could do it. He said, you think you can do it? I said, I know I can do that. And so he took me out. I was about 19. He took me downtown to Ted Brown's. 
and and bought me my first bass guitar. And uh, I started playing. It was so funny because the church we grew up in, very, very musical, a lot, lot of music, a lot of musicians. And on Friday nights, we'd have our evangelistic service. And that was the night I would bring my bass in to practice uh, as they were having service. And it would be so funny, the, the mothers uh, of the church, they would see me come in and they would just start shaking their head like, oh, shoot, she's she, she coming with this stuff. Yeah, but that's how I started uh, playing and took it up and uh, it became pretty natural to me. I don't know when I'll stop playing. It's interesting because uh, my husband just purchased me a, another bass, the one that I've really been wanting for some years. He just uh, purchased that for me. And so I'm really, really excited um, about doing music. I have a band actually, um, it's called Hybrid uh, and we play kind of smooth jazz stuff. And uh, we played for uh, the mayor's uh, inauguration party. We played all around. And so it'll be fun uh, this year if we can get it reelected, um, we'll play again. So yeah, I love, love, love uh, music because music is a gift from God. And I'm telling you, if you get a chance, listen to some good music. I heard you all mention about the music um, at the church and how good and meaningful uh, it is. I've done deep, deep studies on music and frequencies and what it does and how it mixes uh, with the body. And I just uh, believe that music is truly a gift and we need to hold on to it. Let it heal us. Come on, anything, you know what? Uh, back in the day, we used to, when I was at the nonprofit, my business partner, who's my business partner today, and also my ministry partner, um, we used to teach uh, a J-term class at PLU and it was called Multicultural Solutions in the Classroom. Classroom, And we, we, did, we did that probably seven years. But a part of uh, the time, uh, we, we set aside for questions you were always afraid to ask. Um, and, and we, we'd let them have it, you know, they might say, why is your hair like that? Or, you know, I mean, <laughs> and so we decided to just talk it through. That's how you get to know people. So I'm going to invite you to, you know, ask me questions. Now you all call me here. Ask me some questions. You can say any way. Why do your glasses match your shirt? Or yeah, whatever. <laughs> Why is your lipstick matching? Yeah, those things are important to me. But please, please, please feel free uh, to to ask me questions. I'd be remiss if I didn't um, acknowledge the person that that joined us. Uh, please tell me your name. It's you. I'm talking to you. Yes. You can un yep. yes. unmute yes. yourself, Marlene. Marlene. Uh -huh. yeah. Mute yourself. There you go. Unmute. Am I unmuted? Yes. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Marlene. So do you have young people come to your church? Some do. Some do. Uh, <laughs> when we were meeting uh, prior to COVID, we had quite a few young people that would come. Not so much online. Um, and here's the deal. I have church once a month through um, congregational worship. I meet with people. Um, I host a, a Saturday morning uh, time with a group of young, young women. 
Mm -hmm. uh, my sister and I, she's a professor over in Yakima uh, at Heritage University. We host a time that is Rock City work. And then every Monday, I come online and I give uh, something called Jump Off Monday for people to be encouraged. Somebody who was suffering with cancer called me and she says, Pastor Annie, she said, I have a favor uh, to ask you. She said, would you just come online and give us a word? She said, it's gonna help me and it's gonna help hundreds of other people. And um, because she was dying, I said, yes, 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 yes. Yes, I will. And probably it took me about three weeks. Um, but every Monday I get on um, and we do about 10 minutes uh, of kind of motivational speaking on, on Facebook. And it's been amazing to see the response of people. And I, I have people saying, hey, I, I wait for that jump off uh, Monday. So she's gone. Now she's transitioned, gone to glory. Uh, but I still do it uh, in honor of her. So those are the, when I started Rock City, I wanted to be relevant. I wanted to be a relevant, fresh faith expression. Now I'm not poo-pooing on any other ministry because I believe it takes all of us to do this work. Some organized, traditional uh, churches are meeting the needs of people, but many of them are not. And so I knew that I was called to be, mm -mm, uh, to do something a bit different. I encourage people to go be the church. Go be the church. You don't have to sit up in here with me. Mm -hmm. Go be the church. Go rub against somebody and let them experience the love that we talk about, the love of God that we talk so generously about. Go be with somebody else. Go be God in action. And so that that that's just me. That's my my offering and what I feel called to do. If you had asked me this 20 years ago, because I came out of a very, very traditional church. We went to church every day. <laughs> I'm not kidding. We'd have revivals, all of that. If you had told me 20 years ago, Annie, I see you doing this. I would have said, you're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you're nuts. But, but God knew, so. Yes. Thank you, thank you. I think one of the things that's interesting is um, that you are saying to people that they are loved by God. And I think that a lot of times people feel judged by God and not loved by God. And I think um, approaching it from, from that way is, is is different than, you know, maybe some of the ways we were brought up in the church, but I think it's a very um, powerful message. Thank you. Thank you. Here's the deal. I, I have to unpack this stuff in my head. I have to do a brainwash every day because those sort of things, judgment is yeah. what I know. Yeah. It's how I was brought up. And I got a whole uh, idea of why that was. And, and I'm just going to say it very briefly as it relates to the slave owner and the introduction to European Christianity, because I know that my people were God worshipers. Mm -hmm. But when they came to the States, when they were brought to the States in bondage, it was through the eyes of the slave trade and slave owner. That's how our people were introduced to this Christian 
Christianity. So a lot of our churches, our churches are built around this thing of judgment and oppression. And so I have to do a brainwash every day because that's, it's in me. Mm -hmm. It's in me. But I want to be about that God life. How does God love? Mm -hmm. How does God love? How does God, how does Jesus show up uh, in me? What does that love look like? And so I'm about living a life of love and love language. And as you said, uh, telling people there's a God that loves their socks off. Yeah. yeah. Are there any needs that you, that where we could, any way we could support you at your ministry? Always, always, always. Thank you. What a good question. And I, I thank you for that. Prayer is always needed. I always need prayer. We need prayer. Um, I want to uh, start a laundry service oh, yeah. for uh, people who are homeless. Um, on, on Mother's Day, we spend it at the laundromat because we know that there are going to be mothers there during their laundry. Hmm. And so we'll be there and we pay for, for everybody's laundry. And they're like, no, no, no. We just appreciate you being a good mom. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to create um, some kind of laundry service for people who are in these encampments. Because what I see is that some of them are trying to hang their clothes up on fences and trees and things of that nature. Some of these folks are, they're employed. I ran into a young man Friday night as I was dropping my friend off and he was just on her lawn, just standing there, just kind of lost. And it's like, dude, what's up? What are you doing? He said, oh, I'm just trying to figure things out. He says, you know, I want to work. He said, but my clothes are dirty. He said, I have no way to wash and nobody wants to hire me. I show up like this. They're not going to give me a job. And see, that was, that's just what I needed to know that I was hearing from Holy Spirit on that and being relevant. And so I just kind of talked to him a little bit. We gave him our lunch. Uh, we had really good lunch and we gave that to him and I shook some money in his hand and I said, dude, I'm going to be back. I'm going to be looking for you. And so, you know, I'm always engaging people like that because I, I think that's about that God life. I do. I believe that. I'm always engaging people just like that because I want them to know. I speak a word of faith to them and say, you are God's and you are loved. I'm telling you, I say, I know it's hard, but you're going to be okay. So that, that sort of thing, I want to build something where we are, we're providing laundry services where uh, they can get there to the laundromat and wash mm -hmm. their clothes. So that's one thing I want to do. Well, Annie, how do you envision that? How do you envision that being? How uh, a yeah. place or a, how, how, what is your vision for that? Yeah, I think that I'd like to see. Um, I would make an, a a partnership with a uh, a laundromat, and I probably would give um, the folks, the homeless, the unhoused, that's, that's the proper word, the unhoused, I'd probably go talk to them and give them some kind of voucher that says that they can wash there in the laundromat and pay the, um, the, the laundromat uh, owner directly. So maybe a couple of okay. days. 
Yeah. They get the soap and the yeah. 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 Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's all that's what I'm thinking. You know, you can't you can't have dignity in dirty clothes. Yeah. Right. So where are there laundromats that are would be possibilities to do this? And I think all over, but I'm thinking of one in particular that's on the hilltop. Um on on Sixth Avenue. There are several on Sixth Avenue, but one in particular is about Sixth and Sheridan. And I would go there mm -hmm. and make that happen. Right. Yeah. And buy that one. Okay. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking about. Just to you know, just to give people dignity back. Clean clothes. That's that's a help. About transportation getting there. You know, I'm thinking about that as well. You know, with it being COVID, uh, it's just tough. You know, if if it wasn't COVID, I'd create a, a full-on laundry service where, where we'd have an operation where we go and pick up uh, their clothes and wash them. But because we're in this pandemic, I have to be careful. And... And that means I can't get them to the laundromat right now. Do you know if many of the homeless people that you talk to, have they been vaccinated? I'm sure not all of them. I'm sure they haven't. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's what I think about. I have to be very, very careful in those situations. Many of them have not. Many, many of the folks have been misinformed. And, and I mean, you know, and they're not just unhoused. There's a lot of people that have been misinformed around uh, this pandemic. So just kind of trying to talk, talk to them and, and be there. But they are masking, some of them. And when I show up, I'm bringing a mask, okay? I just know I got some extra mask in my pocket. Uh, Pastor Ron had cigarettes, I got mask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm dying to know, do you know Ruby Sales? I saw that she made a comment on your Facebook page one day, and we've listened to Ruby Sales a couple times back in New York, and we just love wow. <laughs> That's bananas. I don't know her. That's bananas. It's just so wild because there are so many people listening. I was at uh, Jubilee. Uh, my husband and, and I do this old people thing and go get ice cream on the weekend sometimes. Uh, and so I'm, I'm in there and the owner is in there and he says, hey, you're jump off Monday, right? And I said, yeah, you listen to that? He said, yes. And he said, give Jubilee a shout out next time. I said, I would. Yeah. Oh, for sure. But it's so many people that are, they're listening and they feel like it's meaningful. So I don't know Ruby Sales. Uh -huh. See, I said, I should have said that. You know, preachers always talking a really long time telling stories. You see that? No, I don't know, Ruby. <laughs> I just just said that. <laughs> Apologies for that. No problem. That was asking anything and everything. <laughs> okay, great. Hey, but I do want to let you all know. I used to be in the top seven nicest people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but when... I start going through menopause. <laughs> I'm just gonna say I dropped down to about 13. So <laughs> not bad. <laughs> not, not bad. <laughs> I really am this nice, trust me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're thinking, oh man, she's really nice. She's got a nice. I really am this nice. <laughs> but don't don't cross me though. <laughs> yeah. So, Annie, if one wanted to access Jump Off Mondays, how would you do that? Um, excuse me, you go to Facebook. 
and look for Annie Jones Barnes. I try to get on around 8.30. That's, that's my plan. 8.30 is my time. Um, yeah, so that's how you do it. Just show up and I'll be there. I tag uh, quite a few people. And uh, I'm on and I'll have some, some good music playing in the background and, and hope, hopefully something meaningful to help people get, get through the week. She shares the love. I've been to listen to one of them that she shares tonight. That's to get. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm gonna tell you something else. I love to laugh, okay? Ooh. Good. I mean, I love, love laughter. And I'm getting me a hearty laugh every single day. I'm going to laugh one of those gut laughs. I'm going to find a reason to laugh, uh, even if it's at myself. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling you. But that, that laughter just brings such good endorphins uh, and good chemicals to the body. So, I mean, that's a gift from God. You know, the scripture says that laughter is like medicine, right? So I'm feeding, I'm, I'm, I'm getting medicine all the time. So I want to encourage you all to, to laugh, find something to laugh about. I agree with that wholeheartedly that I'm known for my laughing, but I have to ask you, Annie, so being a, with your Pentecostal background, what do you think Lutherans need to learn from the Pentecostals? Wow. That is, what are we missing? You know, Lutherans. You know, hey, Lutherans are a little quiet for me. <laughs> but, you know, I call myself a Luther Costal. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it was so funny. Um, Kim Bishop, uh, Kim was the, Yes. Yes. He was the uh, bishop's assistant assistant and uh, so you know when I'm going through this process he says Annie he says do you speak in the tongues I said I sure do <laughs> I said can I do that here and he said well yes you've got a lot to, to teach us but you know yeah I'm, I'm a Luther Costo I've taken who I am and joined my theology uh, with this this journey, and uh, and and let me tell you, I what I want to see in the Lutheran space, I want to see diversity, true true diversity, yeah. as it relates exactly. to mm -hmm. people journeying together, people that look like me. That's my desire. It is not enough for us to be satisfied with the way things are. And so I'd like for the Lutheran church to rise up and lead. Man, the, the, we got so many people leading around this racial reconciliation and it should be the work of the, the church. That's my opinion. And so I would like to see the Lutheran church do its work, number one, here, to dismantle the structures of white supremacy, to dismantle oppression and rebuild this church brick by brick with grace and love. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. That's what I want so badly for this church. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor Annie, for coming Thank and sharing you. with us. Uh, it has been our, a blessing to us. And God bless your work, Annie. 
Mm -hmm. God bless you. Absolutely. Yep. God bless you. I appreciate you. I'm receiving those blessings here. <laughs> you, and you know what? You all continue to do you and be God in action. Let me tell you, it is not over. It's not time for you to sit down and it's not time for you to give up. You've got a lot of love to give and there are people waiting for you. I just wanna encourage you. I want to encourage you and know that you're lovers of God and lovers of people. But just push yourself a bit further you get a lot of wisdom. I see wisdom in this room or in this Zoom room. And people need to hear in times like these and experience the wisdom that you have to give and the love, the unconditional love of God. We're the people of God. One race. Oh, man, I, I got to lay back because I'm telling you, I'm, it don't take much for me to preach. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to lay back. All night revival. Here we come. Yes, that's right. Hey, I told you, I know about revival. It, it's, it's so funny. When I told my mother, I said, Mom, I'm going to do church once a month. She says, oh, Pastor Annie, when, when she wants to get at me, when she wanted to get at me, she put pastor in front of my name, right? I said, Mom, I've been to church enough for two lifetimes, right? <laughs> and uh, so, you know, we, we, we will see um, as the church continues to grow what the people call for, and, and I'm open to that. Yep. And we'll keep in touch. I appreciate you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank for you so me. much. Uh, thank you. God bless you. Reach out, reach out to me. We can just holler and talk a little bit, and and just chop it up as as people say. <laughs> thank you. All right. Bye bye.